Uh, good morning, everyone. Before I move on to Chapter 4, are there any questions? Your uh, laboratory session, yes, please. Right, okay, I can talk about it during the break at the end of the session at 12, or you just wait until the next tutorial. Is that okay? So your laboratory sessions start tomorrow, so all of you do your experiments this week and next week, and your laboratory assignment sheets will be available on Friday, 4th of November. Are there any questions? And the laboratory, uh, the structures laboratory is uh, located on the fourth floor of the James Chatwick building, which is the white and green building just next to the engineering building A. So I answer your question later on today and I now move on to chapter four, please. Chapter four is based on theories of torsion. So you're going to analyze the structures which are subject to a torque. I've divided chapter four to two sections. In section one, we are going to analyze thin cylindrical shells and, sorry, thin We are going to analyze circular sections subject to torsion, and the circular uh, sections could be thin walled, uh, could be <coughs> thick, could be uh, solid. The next uh, section, uh, you're going to analyze uh, thin walled uh, structures of arbitrary shapes. Typical of a wing section, tail section of an aircraft, or fuselage section of an aircraft. They could be single cell, or they could be multi-cell sections. The Second part of uh, section two, the, or I should say the subsection of section two, you will, you're going to analyze open sections subject to torsion, typical of I sections, T sections, or channel sections. I should say the theory is covered in all these uh, three sections. So solid or thick wall circular sections, Thin wall sections, either open or closed, the theories are completely different. You're going to use different sets of equations for each of those uh, three topics. So I just want you to be aware that you're not going to use the same equations. Although all of the structures are subject to torsion, we're going to analyze shear stress produced or angle of twist produced or strain energy stored, but the equations are completely different. I can't say this is a difficult topic because students always do very well when I give them questions in exam or coursework when the structure is subject to torsion. So in terms of application, it's quite straightforward. Some of the equations, they might look complicated, but when you're going to analyze the structures, it's not as complicated as they look. So first of all, I would like to show you the difference between a bending moment and a torsional moment, and that is covered on slide number one. On slide number one, you see a solid a circular cylinder which is fixed at one end and is subject to either torsion or bending. So if you look at the first example, <coughs> you can see the cylinder is subject to a moment. The plane of the moment is y z axis. So I have attached x y z coordinate system to the cross section. X y is on the plane of the cross section, and z is along the axis of the cylinder. You can see the moment at the moment is the plane of the moment is a normal to the cross section. The plane of the moment is the yz axis, and yz is normal to the plane. So the effect of this moment is bending the structure. 
So that's why we call it a bending moment. And the outcome is the deflection in the y direction. So you can see that it, this is an exaggerated deformed geometry of the beam, and it deflects in the y direction. So the second example, you can see the cross-section is subject to a moment. The moment is, again, the plane of the moment, which is the x Z axis or the XZ plane is normal to the cross section. So again, this moment is called a bending moment because it bends it about the Y axis and the deflection is in the X direction. So these two, the plane of the moment or the plane of the, the two moments we have, the A plane, are normal to the section, so the effect is called bending. Now, if you look at the top figure, it is also subject to a moment. But the plane of the moment is XY plane. And XY plane is, obviously, is the same plane as the cross-section. So the effect is twisting the structure. So we call this a torsional moment. The other two are called bending moments. But all of them are obviously moments. So just summarize it. If the plane of the moment is normal to the cross-section, the effect is bending. If the plane of the moment is tangent or parallel to the cross-section, the effect is a twisting or torsional effect. Now we can show a torsional moment in a three-dimensional, using a three-dimensional figure or we can use a two-dimensional figure to show a torsional moment. In that case, we use a double arrow. So using the right-hand rule, the double arrow shows the direction of my thumb here. And the way my fingers, my right-hand fingers curl, that is the direction of the moment. So we can show it as a three-dimensional, in a three-dimensional space. Or to in a two-dimensional uh, diagram, we use double arrow. The good thing is when we use a double arrow, then we can treat a, a torque like a force. It makes our analysis much easier, which I'll show you later on today. So in figure one, I've shown you the difference between a torsional moment and bending moment. So in this chapter, we focus on torsion. In the next chapter, we focus on bending. Now, on figure number two, on slide number two, I've given you different examples of torsion, the structures which are subject to torsion. You can see this is a gear shaft, uh, sorry, a gear box. I mean, what's wrong with me? I keep making mistakes. So a shaft it transmits, obviously, power. It transmits power from engine, from motor, to various devices. So it constantly rotates. So a shaft is constantly subject to a torque. So if you look at this a gearbox, once you start the car and the engine is working, so you can see both the lay shaft and the main shaft are subject to torsion. The other good example is the power transmission system of a car. So you can see the engine is creating power the power via the drive shafts goes to back axle, and from the back axle, it goes to the back wheels. So the drive shaft and the back axle, they are constantly rotating when the car is moving, so they are constantly subject to a torque. The other example is a spring. The spring, when you apply force, the spring itself is subject to a compressive force or it could be subject to a tensile force. But different uh, sections of a spring, as you can see, are subject to a torsion, subject to torque. The other examples that you should be familiar with is an aircraft. During flight, because of the weight of the engines, because of the weight of whatever is in an aircraft, the wing is subject to torsion, the fuselage is subject to torsion, and also, the wing sections are subject to torsion. 
So on the top, we focus, if you're analyzing the structures on the top, we focus on circular cylinders subject to torque because all the shafts are circular. For the bottom one, obviously, we are analyzing the structures which are thin walled but of arbitrary shape. The shapes, as you can see, could be anything, but what they have in common, they are either closed section, thin walled sections, or open section, thin walled. So the closed section could be single cell, as you can see on the left hand side, the fuselage is single cell, and you can see the wing section is a double cell. So these are different examples for structures which are subject to torsion. So this is, we start, as I said, I've divided it, I divided this section to two parts. We start with circular sections, they could be solid, they could be hollow, they could be thin wood. The second section, then it's been divided to two subsections. So at the moment we leave the second section alone and we focus on analysis of circular cylinders subject to torsion. So in this figure, this is fixed at one end and is subject to a moment which is tangent to parallel to this cross section at the other end. And this is how we show it in a two-dimensional diagram. So based on what we know, if I apply a torque on the other side, it twists. So one cross-section on one side it rotates with respect to the other side. So the other side is fixed, has no rotation. But the other side, which is this side, the free side, it rotates. Now I would like you to imagine this solid cylinder. We know it is homogeneous. We know it's isotropic and homogeneous, which we're analyzing. I would like you to imagine it's made of a series of very, very thin disks which are tightly stuck together. Now, if I apply a torque at one side here, the first disks, in order to transmit rotation from one side to another, it applies, it rotates, and it applies a shear force to the disk, to the disk next to it. So, it is rotating, the first one, then applies a shear force to transmit the rotation to the next disc. And the same, the second disc transmitted to this next one by applying a shear force to it. It means when we apply a torsion to a structure, the outcome is not an axial force, tension or compression. When you apply a torque, the intensity of the stress the outcome is the shear stress. In order for the force or for the torque to be transmitted from one side to another. Now what about in terms of deformation? In chapter one, if we had an axial loading applied to a ball, it was in terms of the stress or normal stress, in terms of deformation was axial deformation or axial extension or compression. Or con uh, contraction. <clears throat> now what about when we apply torque to a, a structure? Now first I ask you to imagine it's made of a series of a disc stuck together. Now this time I would like you to imagine it's made of a series of metal fiber. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> It's made of a series of metal fibers which are tightly stuck together. I know, I'm sure you've seen a metal fiber. So say we've got a bunch of metal fibers which are tightly stuck together, and this is how you see the cross-section. So when we apply a torque to the cross-section, a typical metal fiber moves from this location to a new position. Say if theta is the angle of rotation or angle of twist because of the torque I'm applying to this cylinder, then a metal fiber, it's an exaggerated deformed geometry, moves from a point such as this point here to a new position. So this is what we call angular displacement of this fiber. So what do we conclude here? 
It means if you apply torque to a circular cylinder, in terms of stress, it's shear stress. In terms of deformation, is angular deformation or angular twist. Now, in order to analyze a circular cylinder subject to torsion, we need to make some assumptions. First of all, because the section is solid or thick walled, we say the circular cylinders, they remain circular. So a circular cylinder doesn't become an elliptical section. It remains circular. And also, because it's very it's solid, so the shape doesn't change, we cannot make the same assumption for thin walled sections. We can make it for solid circular cylinders. So the circular cylinder, the circular sections remain circular and remain a normal to the cross-section an axis of the cylinder. What does this mean? It means it doesn't warp. So if I apply a torsion to the circular cylinder, the cross-section remains a normal to the axis of the cylinder. It doesn't go forward or backwards. So if I rotate it, it remains circular and remains a normal to the axis of the cylinder. I'm afraid we cannot make this assumption for thin sections. When you apply a torsion, a torque, to a thin wall section, not only it, the shape is slightly changed, it also warps as well. It might go forward and backwards. So the cross section doesn't remain a normal to the axis of the cylinder. And the other, the third assumption, which is the whole course is based on material has linear elastic behavior, is isotropic, and also homogeneous. So based on these three assumptions, I'm going to show you a few equations, how to analyze this type of structures when they are subject to a torque. So no warping displacement, the cross section remains normal to the axis of cylinder while it is rotating, and circular cross-sections remain a circular. So these are the assumptions we have. Yes, please. Uh, do we still apply these assumptions to the ladder point? Could you say they will louder? Uh, do we still apply those assumptions to the ladder point? To the ladder? <coughs> yes, of course, yes. Because you are going to analyze a uh, tube, although it is a thing, but still you can apply these, yes, of course, yes, that's a good question. Are there any other questions? Okay. Now this is something I've borrowed from chapter one. If I've got a block which is fixed at the bottom and is subject to a shear force at the top, then the top surface will be displaced a bit, which we're calling shearing displacement. So delta in this figure, so delta in this figure is a shear displacement. And we define uh, the shear strain as the top surface displacement or shear displacement delta divided by uh, the height of the block. So gamma is equal to delta over H. <coughs> That was the definition of a shear strain in chapter one. Now, how do we define shear strain in this? For a circular cylinder, which is subject to a torque. So we found out that when it's subject to a torque, in terms of stress, it's subject to shear stress in terms of deformation is, has angular deformation, or angular twist. And how are we going to define a shear strain in this structure which is subject to a torque? So this is, as I said, an exaggerated deformed shape. It means when I apply a torque, you have an angular twist of theta, which is a very, very small value, and a point on the surface of the cylinder, which is A, 
moves to a new position, such as C. So AC is uh, the shearing displacement of point A, which is located on the surface of the cylinder. Now, as I said earlier, we, do, we assume uh, the cylinder is made of a series of uh, metal fibers which are stuck tightly together. Now, I'm looking at a fiber which is located at the distance of as R from the center. So again, this is going to move a new position. So you can see this point moves to E. So DE is it the shearing displacement of this metal fiber. Now that is the cylinder. You're looking at the side view of the cylinder. So point A moves to a new position. So this point moves to a new position here. And this point moves to a new position such as E. Now say this a fiber is a located on a cylinder within the big cylinder. <laughs> so I would like you to imagine we have a cylinder, the red one, which is inside the big cylinder. And that fiber D is located on the surface of this cylinder, of this red one, which is within the big one. So that is, so that is the red one, which is this, what you see as dash line. And point D is located on the surface of this the red one, moves to a new position such as E. So if I show it on this diagram, I can say similar to what we have on the bottom figure, in the bottom figure, point D is moved to a new position and we call DE the shear displacement. So DE is comparable with delta S here. The length of the cylinder is comparable with the height of this block. So I can say the shear displacement of this fiber, which is located at the distance of R from the center of this circle, is equal to DE over L, similar to what you see here. So I'm, I told you this is coming from chapter one. I'm just comparing them. So I can say for fiber D, the shear strain is equal to shearing displacement DE divided by the length. Now, the angular twist is very small because material has linear elastic behavior. It means theta is very, very small, much less than six degrees. So in that case, I can say DE is equal to R theta. If this is the central angle, angle of twist, I can say DE is equal to R theta theta. This is location of D from the center. Now, in chapter one, how did we relate the shear strain to shear stress? The shear stress was equal to G shear modulus multiplied by gamma. This is coming from stress strain curve. The slope of the curve was G shear modulus. So two was the vertical axis. X was the shear string. So I can say two is equal to G gamma. So it means I substituted the top, the top equation in the second one. Therefore, shear stress is equal to G theta over L multiplied by R. But what does this equation tell us? G is a constant value, is a material property. For a certain value of t, the torque, theta is also constant. It's not a variable. L obviously is constant. It means a g, a theta over L, the whole a term is a constant value. But r is not constant. It's the distance of any fiber from the center of the circle. So it means the shear stress because of the torque applied to a circular cylinder has a linear variation in terms of R. So R is equal to zero, which is the center of the circle. The shear stress is zero. When R is maximum, the outer layer, which is equal to capital R, therefore the shear stress is maximum. 
So it is very important, this equation. Shear stress has a linear variation in terms of R. And if I want to draw the profile of the shear stress distribution, this is how it looks like. I've drawn it for you on the x-axis, but the section has infinite number of axes of symmetry. Therefore, at any angle, you see exactly the same as shear stress distribution. We have the maximum stress on the outer layer. We've got zero stress at the center. So if I apply a torsion on this tube, if I apply torsion, the outer layer will be subject to maximum shear stress. It is solid, so the center remains unstressed. Now, we can apply the same equations when we have a circular cylinder, which is hollow. And still, we get a linear distribution of stress. The only difference is that we don't have zero stress. We have maximum stress on the outer layer, and we've got minimum stress on the inner layer. The same equation still applies for a thin walled cylinder, circular cylinder, provided it has a uniform thickness. You might say we assumed for a thin wall it has warping displacement, but we, at some step, extent, we can apply it to thin wall cylinders, similar to the one you're going to do experiment on in the next couple of weeks. So on this slide, I showed you a relation between the shear stress and radius R. G theta over L is a constant value. Are there any questions in relation to a slide four? Yes, please. So in this figure, the point A, is it exactly opposite to point B? Or is it at the same point? Say it again, please. At the moment is point E. I have drawn it for you here, say point E in the figure shows here, right? But it's also a point here as well. So all these points, when you're looking at it, it rotates. All this, I mean, all these points rotate about so the then, center. Uh, Oh, you're so, okay, I know what you're trying to tell me. You're telling me if this is really a triangle, a straight angle, is the right angle triangle or not? Is this what you're trying to yeah, say? Yeah, because uh, here uh, gamma is E D over A D. And if B is inside, then A D won't be No, 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 no. This cylinder is within the bigger cylinder, okay? So at the moment, this, this point here is actually this point here. Does it, does it answer the question? A is also located on the fixed support, but it is on the bigger circle. Now point D, which you're looking at at the moment, and at the other side of it, is located on the smaller, which is within the bigger one. Does it answer the question? But then, uh, so if A and B are not exactly opposite, won't the distance okay. be greater than No, 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 no. Here, the way I've sh in books usually, they don't uh, show you this cylinder. They only show you this. And then, if I hadn't shown you this figure here, yes, you would have said, how does this work? What I am saying is this A is not located at the same point as this point here. This is on the outer circle, and this is on the inner circle. But when you're looking at the side view, they're all located, they look at exactly the same position. Now, if you look at textbooks, they don't show you this inner circle. They just show you the way I've drawn it here. So then you would ask me, yes, how does this work? Because one is here, the other one is there. But if you look at this diagram here, 
this point A doesn't exist on this diagram because it's on the outer circle. Does it answer the question? Okay. The other question usually a student asks when you are rotating it, maybe this is not a right angle triangle. And, but because it's a very small deformation, we can assume it is. Does it answer the question? Okay. Any other questions? So we move on to finding, at the moment, I show you that the shear stress has a linear variation. So we related the shear stress to shear strain, and we related it to the position of the fiber from the center. Now the next, on slide number five, we are going to find a direct relation between the torque applied the angle of twist and the shear stress distribution within the structure. So that is a slide number five. These are the equations you're going to use for the analysis of circular cylinders subject to torque. So this structure is subject to torsion. And we're looking at the cross section. And I'll show you that on any point on this section, we have a shear stress because of the torque. So say we are looking at an a small element with the area of DA, which is located at the distance of R from the center. Say that red circle is a fiber, a metal fiber. We assume it's made of so many metal fibers which are stuck together. So if this section is subject to shear stress, it means this tiny element is subject to a shear force, such as the F. How did we define shear stress? Shear stress is force divided by the area. Now, if this element is subject to a force of DF and the section is subject to shear stress of a two, I can say DF is equal to two times DF, DA. What was the definition of two? Two was equal to DF over DA. On the previous slide, I showed you that a tool is equal to G theta over L multiplied by R. Oh. Now, this is a, a shear force applied to this element. Now, this is located, this force is located at the distance of R from the center. So R multiplied by DF gives us a tiny torque, which is, a, we call it resistant torque because of the external torque. Obviously, all the metal fibers are carrying some torque, an amount, some amount of torque. So if I integrate RDF over the cross-section, that is equal to the external torque. So what you see on the right-hand side is the resistant torque from the material, what you see on the left-hand side is the torque applied. Now, I showed you DF is equal to 2 times a DA. So I just substitute in this equation. And on the other hand, 2 is equal to G theta over L multiplied by R. So I substitute in the equation as well. So we have torque applied, which is equal to G theta over L, double integral of R squared dA. And from chapter three, what was this called? Was it second moment of area or polar second moment of area? Polar second moment of area. Polar second moment of area. That's very good, thank you. So double integral of R squared dA in chapter three was the polar second moment of area of the cross section with respect to the center or with respect to the Z axis, which is we can't see as it's normal to the plane of the circle. So R squared dA is the polar second moment of area of the cross section. Where does this come from? From chapter three. So therefore, the torque applied is equal to the shear modulus angle of twist multiplied by J polar second moment of area 
divided by the length of the tube. And for a circular cylinder, for a circular cylinder, J is equal to, I would like you to look at the, the table you had in chapter three. For a circular cylinder, J is equal to pi over 32 multiplied by the fourth power of diameter. If it's a solid, circular cylinder. If it's a hollow circular cylinder, then J is equal to pi over 32 multiplied by the fourth power of outer diameter minus fourth power of inner diameter. You don't need to memorize it. By the time you go for exam, you learn it by heart. I don't ask you to memorize it, but you learn it yourself anyway. Now I'm going to rearrange these equations. Now at the moment, you see equation we're showing you angle of twist, which is equal to TL divided by GJ. And the product of GJ is called a torsional stiffness. The higher the value of GJ is, the lower the angle of twist is, and vice versa. So you can see the torsional stiffness has a, an element of material property, and it's got an element of a geometry, J. So these two define how stiff this component is. Now if I rearrange the equations and substitute the top one in the bottom one, I can find a direct relation between the torque applied and the shear stress within the structure. J is constant, T is constant, and as I showed you earlier, the shear stress has a linear variation in terms of R. We've got the maximum on the outer layer and we've got either zero stress for a solid section at the center or minimum shear stress on the inner layer provided it's a tube or a hollow cylinder. So we are going to use these two equations for analysis of a circular cylinders subject to torsion. I repeat, they are not applicable for thin sections. They are not applicable for either open section, I mean thin walled open <coughs> section or closed sections. Both of them have different sets of equations. So as I said on last week, <coughs> my apology, as I said last week, a J defines how strong or stiff the structure is. You can see the higher value of J is, the lower the stress is, the high value of J is at the lower angle of twist is. So this defines the strength of the material and this defines at the stiffness of the material. Any question on slide number five? So I showed you these on the previous slide as well. So this is at the polar second moment of area of a solid cylinder and this is the polar second moment of area of a hollow cylinder tube. No questions? Okay. Now, on a slide a number six, I have added all the units used in this chapter. So we have nothing new here. The only thing which is a new to us on this slide is the unit of angle of twist. The unit of angle of twist in the equation of theta TL over GJ is not degrees, it's a radians. Could you please highlight it? This is very important. So angle of rotation is in <coughs> radians, a common mistake among you in exam. So angle of rotation in this equation is not degrees, is radians. Once you find in radians in this equation, you can convert it to degrees. And the other term which I will refer to throughout this chapter is the rate of twist. In engineering, when a structure is subject to torque, usually it's important to know the angle of twist per unit length. 
usually per unit a meter of the shaft or circular cylinder. So this is the two red ones, the highlighted ones are the ones which are new to you. The rest I'm 100% sure you already know about them. The units of length, torque, which is newton meter and newton millimeter, for the second moment of area, which is fourth power of meter, and the rest you're familiar with. So these two are new to you. Any question on the slide six? So let's solve a couple of examples to reinforce the materials I've covered so far. So we solve the question number one. In question number one, we've got a circular cylinder which is solid with a diameter of 50 millimeters, shear modulus of 85 gigapascals, it means it's made of a steel, is subject to a torque of one kilonewton meter over a length of one meter. The problem is asking us to find the angle of rotation or angle of twist and the maximum shear stress applied to this cylinder. Does anyone remember, as I said earlier, where is the position of the maximum shear stress when a solid cylinder is subject to a torsion? Outer, excellent. So when it's subject to torsion, the outer layer is subject to the maximum shear stress. In this case, it's solid. The center is subject to zero stress. The equation for two is equal to TR over J, the torque applied, the radius of the cylinder divided by J. <laughs> so please look at the equation. R is a variable. Please write down next to R. It's not just you're interested on, on the outer layer. Sometimes you're interested at a point within the structure. So R is a variable. It's not a constant. Yes, please. So that's when it comes to the whole maximum shear stress, R is equal to the diameter. Right? Yes. So yes, that's absolutely correct. So for the maximum shear stress, little r is equal to capital R. Now G, this is a solid cylinder. Look at the equation I've got. It's pi d4 over 32. So a common mistake among you in exam. I give the students a thin wall cylinder, they use this equation. So this is for just a solid cylinder. There's no hole inside, or it's not a thin wall cylinder. So I have D, I substitute this equation, and this is the value of J, fourth power of a millimeter, the unit. So I substitute R equal to capital R, so I have a torque of a one a kilonewton meter, so it gives me 10 to the power of a three newton meters. Another one gives me newton millimeters, so I have multiplied one kilonewton meter by 10 to the power of six to convert it to newton millimeters. The diameter is 50 millimeters, so the radius is 25, so this distance is 25. J is I've calculated it, I substituted it here. So the answer will be in newton millimeter squared. It mean, and one newton per millimeter squared is one pascal, one megapascal. So we've got 41 megapascals. So the maximum shear stress applied on the outer layer is 41 megapascals. The angle of twist is equal to T, the torque applied, the length divided by the torsional stiffness, which is the product of G and J. So T is equal to 10 to the power of six. Length is of one meter, and I've converted it to millimeter. Some students prefer to have everything in Newton and meter is your choice. And, and we've got G, which is 85. Gigapascals, so I've kept it as a newton per millimeter squared, and J is already millimeter, a fourth power of millimeter, so the answer will be in radians, and then I convert it to degrees. So 
So in order to convert it, multiply it by 180 divided by pi. So I repeat, the answer to theta in this equation is in radians. Did you have a question? No? Question? Are you happy with this solution? Yes. Yes. Shall we move on to the next one? Thank you. So this one is exactly the same as the first one, except it's hollow, similar to the one you're going to be to do your experiments on, your tests on. Here we've got a tube with the outer diameter of 57 millimeters, inner diameter of 43 millimeters, and we're just repeating the same procedure, finding the angle of twist and the maximum shear stress. Is the maximum shear stress on the inner layer or outer layer? Outer layer, well done. So T times R divided by G, where R is maximum, is the maximum shear stress we have over there. So here we've got two max, T, R max divided by J, R max, how much is R max? Excellent, 57 over two is R max. So I substitute the value of J. How do I find J? J is equal to pi over 32, fourth power of outer diameter, that's absolutely correct. So it gives us 0, 0,7 times 10 to the power of 6, 4 power of millimeter. I substitute the values. So it gives me 41 megapascals. And the angle of an arming, which is the inner diameter, oh, sorry, inner radius. So we have uh, the maximum stress of 41 megapascals on the outer layer, 31 on the inner layer, with the angle of twist of almost one a degree. Any questions on these two solutions? So what you see on this slide at the moment is very similar to what you're going to do for your, for the analysis part of your laboratory activity. Yes, please. That is a good question. If there is no explanation or description in the requirements given to in the exam paper, just do whatever you want, radians or degrees. If you were asked to find it in degrees, obviously you should do it in degrees. If not, I'm quite happy with radians. No mark will be reduced, no. Whichever you're more comfortable with. But in engineering, people understand degrees better, so in practical. In industry, people usually use degrees rather than radians. So let's compare these two solutions. So on the top one, we have a solid cylinder, and we have a maximum stress of 41 megapascals, an angular rotation of 1.1 degrees. Bottom one, we've got a hollow cylinder, and the maximum stress is exactly the same as the top one. Both of them are subject to the same maximum stress. The angle of twist of the top one is higher than the bottom one, although it is a solid. Now, I've compared the weight of these two. The top one is almost twice the, has twice the weight of the bottom one. As an engineer, which one would you choose? The top one or bottom one? How many of you think it's the bottom one is more attractive? You think it's bottom one? You think it's bottom one? Excellent. So the bottom one has an optimized weight. It carries the same maximum stress. It has even a low, the bottom one has even a lower angle of twist, it means it has a higher stiffness than the top one, and the weight is half the top one. So why it happened? Why do we have a better performance from the bottom one? 
because the solution it depends on the value of J. The higher the value of J is, the lower the stress on angular rotation are. So what we've done here, we have removed the material from the center and we have increased the diameter because this equation, and can you see if I increase the O, it increases J. So the center is not carrying much load. So we remove the load, increase the diameter, and it gives us a better performance. So we call bottom one and optimize the version of the top one. Yes, please. No, no, not the thinner, the, high, the diameter. You need to increase the diameter to increase J. Yes, if you increase J, that is how the, it affects the stress and stiffness. Not just because of being thinner. If I just make this structure hollow and keep the outer diameter the same, <laughs> the performance is worse than the a solid one. So what I've done here, I've increased the diameter. The outer diameter here is higher. Look at the description, it's 57, and the other one is 50 millimeters. So the outer diameter is higher. So we've removed the material from the center, which is not carrying any load, but we've increased the outer diameter. So it is a nine minutes, eight minutes to 11, and I'll see you at 11, please. I believe a couple of questions I have to answer. I can answer those questions.
Uh, may, may I have your attention, please? Please, could you sit down? Thank you. So in the first hour, I showed you that if you've got a circular cylinder, solid, hollow, or even thin walled, in terms of stress, the cross-section is subject to shear stress. In terms of deformation, the cross-section twists about its axis, the axis of the cylinder. Now the next slide, slide number seven, is just definition type. I referred to shear stress being complementary in chapter one. This is what I was talking about in chapter one as well, that shear stress being always a complementary. So I showed you in chapter one, if you've got an element which is subject to shear stresses, such as this, uh, whatever you see on the figure, if you've got shear stresses acting in this plane, in order for the element to attain equilibrium, there should be a shear stress acting on planes which are normal to the first one. And the couple created by these two must be equal in opposite direction of the 
the bonds created on the vertical planes. So that is the definition of shear stress being complementary. Whenever we have shear stress on a plane, we always have shear stress on a plane acting on another plane normal to the first one, and the couple created by these two is equal in the opposite direction of the couple created by the other two in the vertical or the perpendicular planes. Now, I showed you that if we've got a circular cylinder subject to a torque, the cross-section is subject to shear stress. So based on this definition of shear stress being always complementary, it means if I take an element from this cylinder, if I've got shear stress on the cross-section, there must be shear stresses acting in the longitudinal direction of the cylinder as well. So this, the, this is the shear stress distribution on the cross-section, and this is the shear stress because of the characteristic of shear stress being complementary. So we have a shear stress on the cross-section, and we also have in the longitudinal direction of the cylinder. That is, a, that is the characteristic of shear stress being complementary. Whenever we've got it on one plane, we also have always have it on another plane, which is normal to the first one. Now we move on to the next slide. This is a review slide. I've borrowed it from chapter one. If you remember, if you have a, we have a bar and we apply a force to a bar, so say this is a bar which is subject to tension. So in this case, if the material has linear elastic behavior, the work done by the force is stored as a strain energy in the component. And as soon as the force is removed, the energy is released and the component goes back to its initial shape. We define the area under the force deflection response as the total strain energy stored or the work done. If the material has linear elastic behavior, the two are the same based on the law of conservation of energy. I showed you if we have the nature of the stress is normal, and this is the stress strain curve of the material up to the yield point, the area under the curve shows us the strain energy is stored per unit volume of the structure. If the stress distribution is uniform, we multiply by the strain energy stored per unit volume by the total volume. If the stress is not uniformly distributed, then we have to perform a volume integral. If the nature of the stress is shear, we have to use this equation. We have to use uh, this uh, curve uh, to find uh, the strain energy stored per unit of its volume. So SE in this case is equal to 2 squared, the shear stress, divided by 2G. If the shear stress is uniformly distributed, I just multiply this term by the volume. If not, then I have to perform a volume integral. Now, I just showed you that if we've got a cylinder which is subject to a torque, the cross-section is subject to shear stress. So I am allowed to use this equation to find the shear stress stored per unit of its volume. But because shear stress is not uniformly distributed, has a linear relation in terms of R, the radius or the position from the center of the cylinder, I'm not allowed to multiply it by the volume. So that is what I'm going to cover in the next slide. Finding the energy stored in a cylinder which is subject to a torque, based on this equation which I covered for you in chapter one. So this is a review slide. I call it slide 18, but it's coming from chapter one. I put this at the end of this, and the, at, very end of this 
your slides in chapter four. So we are after the strained energy stored in a, in a circular cylinder, which is subject to a torque. As I said, we, one of the assumptions was the material has linear elastic behavior. And this is the law of conservation of energy. The total energy stored is equal to work done by the external force or external torque. Now this is the torque angle of twist response. The angle of twist has no unit. The unit is radians. And engineering is not a unit. I know it is radians, but if you look at this, straight energy here, or the work done, that has the same unit as torque, which is kilonewton meter, newton millimeter, or <coughs> so. this is a torque angle of twist response. And this is the work done by the external torque, which is T times theta over two, very similar to what we had. Force multiplied by axial displacement divided by two. And this is coming from chapter one. A component which is subject to shear stress, the nature of the stress is shear. We can use this equation, two squared divided by two G, to find the energy stored per unit of its volume. Now, the only problem we have, as I said earlier, shear stress here is not uniformly distributed. Shear stress is equal to TR over J. So shear stress is not uniform, like a simple shear. We had some examples in chapter one. It has a, its profile is linear. So here we need to perform a volume integral, to find a volume integral over the section to find the total energy stored in the component. If we have got angle of twist, fine. We multiply it by T divided by two, which is quite straightforward. If you do not have angle of twist, then you need to follow the procedure I'll show you next. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to find the volume integral of this cylinder. So dV is the differential of volume. How do we define dV? dV is equal to dx multiplied by dy multiplied by dz. Now in this chapter, we assume the cylinder has a uniform cross-sectional area along its length. So I can say dv is equal to dA multiplied by dz. So I repeat, this differential of volume is equal to dx, dy, dz. But because this cross-sectional area is uniform along the length, I can say this dv is equal to an element of dA multiplied by dz. And tau is equal to tr over j. So tau squared is equal to t squared, r squared divided by j squared. I substitute the values. So I converted a triple integral to a double integral. One element is dA, so dx dy became dA. dz, I keep it as dz. Now I've got g, which is constant, can be transferred out, can be moved out of the integral. t is constant, it can be moved out. j is constant, it can move out as well. Now, I separated two two integrals, so the function is separable. You can see I've divided it to integral of dz. Z is length is, the cross-sectional area is uniform along the length. So therefore, integral of dz is quite straightforward. It's just the length. In some books, they don't write as dz. It just automatically, they write it out. Some of the textbooks you have online. Now, does anyone remember what this term was? Integral of R squared dA? Somebody said it? Very good, very good, thank you. So this is equal to J. 
So this, I, if I substitute it in this equation, R squared is equal to J. We've got a J here as well. So they will be, one of them will be canceled out. So therefore we end up with one over two G, T squared, J squared, LJ. And if I substitute it in the top equation, I can say this straight energy stored is equal to T squared times L divided by two GJ. I believe I noticed that in your PDF file, this bit has been removed. I don't know why, but however, this is correct. This must be here. And so this gives us a total energy stored. In a bar, please write down next to this term. This is only applicable if the section has a circular shape, has it's uniform along its length. We can directly use this equation. And if I substitute this equation, if I equate these two together, I can prove that the angle of twist equal to TL over GJ. So I repeat, this is how I found the strain energy stored in a circular cylinder subject to a torque. Now one of the questions I asked a couple of years ago from a student is that, prove based on the law of conservation of energy that the angle of twist is equal to TL over GJ. On, a on the previous slides I show you in the first hour, I use equilibrium to find this equation. Here I've used the, in this equation based on the law of conservation of energy. So I go back. So the nature of the stress is shear. In chapter one, the energy stored per unit volume is equal to two squared divided by two G. We cannot multiply by the volume because stress is not uniformly distributed. So we have to find the volume integral of this term, two squared divided by 2G. dV is equal to dx dy dz. Because the section is uniform along the length, I say dV is equal to dA multiplied by dz. Two squared is equal to TR over J, so it's equal to T squared, R squared divided by J squared. Now the integral is separable. I put R squared DA in one integral, integral of DZ in another integral. It's quite straightforward, this is just equal to L. And this is based on what we had in chapter three is equal to J. So we've got J squared here, this is equal to J, so it's going to be eliminated. So the answer is S equal to T squared L divided by 2GJ. Now if I was asking an exam based on the law of conservation of energy to find the angle of twist, then I equate this term with this term and find the angle of twist. This is what I've done here. I've equated these two and I found the angle of twist. So what you see here is based on the law of conservation of energy, what I showed you earlier on, I believe it's slide five, is based on equilibrium. I equated the external torque to the internal torque or the existing torque to find the angle of twist. The other thing I would like you to write down is that if you have angle of twist and you were asked in exam to find the straight energy stored, just use this equation. Do not do any of this integration. It's just time consuming. Directly go for this relation here. Because this is also applicable to thin walled closed sections. So this equation here only applicable to circular cylinders which are subject to a torque. Any questions on the slide eight? So I'm going to use this equation here to find the energy stored or work done, for example, one. It's not part of the requirements, 
I just added it yesterday. So I'm going to find the total energy stored for uh, this example. This, we did it in the first hour. We've got the angle of twist. We've got the torque. So we just find uh, the energy stored, which is 9.5 joules. You can either use this equation, but for this is, I believe, I advise you to use this one, which is much easier, gives you 9.5 joules. So theta has no unit, so therefore the torque and the energy have the same unit. Okay, that's, so for the t squared over 2 gj, this only works with circular uniform cylinders, right? Correct. It doesn't make any difference. Anything? Yes. As long as they have a circular cylinders and they are um, uniform along their length, yes. Because J, um, the question you're asking is that the difference will be the value of J. If you correctly calculate the J, being hollow or being solid will affect the J value. Any other questions? Okay. Now let's solve question seven, which is a bit different. And the only question usually a student asks is that at the, end, at the start of this course, I said that we analyze static problems, problems that do not, structures do not move during static equilibrium. Usually she asks, how come you're solving a shaft which is rotating? It's not a static problem anymore. It's subject to a constant torque. And the answer to that question that I usually, sometimes I get is that, if a, com a structure, a component, is subject to a series of loads and is has no acceleration, it can be treated like a static problem. Like a car is moving, if it has no acceleration, then we analyze it as a static problem. So for a shaft which is rotating, if the rotational acceleration is zero, it can be treated like a static problem. So that's why we can analyze this shaft which is rotating. So this one at the moment, question number seven, we've got a stepped a shaft, which is a subject to a torque of 15 kilonewton meters. <laughs> the problem is acid and it's made of different materials. The left part of it is made of copper and part of it is made of, I believe, steel. So copper and the steel. So the problem is asking us to find the maximum shear stress in each material, the total angle of twist of the entire shaft, it means the rotation of C with respect to A, and also the total energy stored. And the shear moduli of both are given. So that is question number seven, it's slightly different. Now, when we draw uh, the torque by double arrow, it makes our analysis easier because we can treat a torque like a force. So I would like you to look at these torque at them, these two torques applied, torsional moments, like two forces applied at two ends. If you remember in chapter one, I analyzed a step shaft which was subject to axial loading. So over there, we found the free body diagram of each section of the shaft. And we do here, we do exactly the same here. So I'm going to cut the copper section by this imaginary plane. And this is the free body diagram of the copper section. So both parts, both sides are subject to a torque of T. One is external, the other one is internal. I do the same for the right one. Oh my God, are you right?
So this diagram shows a, the free body diagram of each section of the shaft. Now our objective is to find the maximum shear stress applied on each section. So this is the equation we can use. And the maximum shear stress occurs on the outer layer for each one. But we need to use a J value for each of them, each of those two sections individually. So the first one gives us 76.4 megapascals. And the next one gives us, do you think that for number two, we get a lower stress or higher stress? No, 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 I, you did your daily one. <laughs> what is the number two? Is this higher or lower? Yes, please. Lower. Excellent, and why? Uh, larger surface or cross-sectional area. Excellent, because it has a higher J value. Absolutely correct, well done. So the second one, must be lower because it has a, hot, a larger diameter. Therefore, the J value is higher, so it gives us a lower stress value. Now, the next part is to find the angle of twist. So when a shaft is rotating, we are finding the angle of twist of one end with rest to the other end. As I said, the whole thing is ro rotating. So in this case, I can say the angle of twist of C with respect to A is equal to the angle of twist of B with respect to A plus C with respect to B. So if you remember in chapter one, if the shaft was subject to axial loading, I added the displacement of the left part of the shaft to the displacement of the right part of the shaft. This is very similar. Here we find the angle of twist of B with respect to A plus C with respect to B and add them up. It gives us the angle of twist of C with respect to A. Now this is equal to the torque applied, the length divided by GJ, and the same for the right one. Both are subject to the same torque, but they have different lengths and different shear moduli and sh polar second moments of area. So it's the torque applied, length. I've kept everything in Newton and in uh, meter. So this remains as gigapascal. So I've converted it to pascal. This is meter meter, I've converted it to Newton meters, and the answer is 1.51 degrees. The strain energy stored, I just multiply the total um, angle of twist in radians, by T and divided by two. Or you can use a T squared, the equation I showed you, T squared L divided by two GJ for each one of them individually and add them up. But this is much easier. If you find the angle of twist for the whole section, for the whole structure and then multiply it by T divided by two. Questions on this slide? So I repeat, we can apply the equations for static <coughs> problems to dynamics problems if they have no acceleration.
So this is what I covered on Friday afternoon during the problem solving session. So this is borrowed from chapter three. If you've got a thin walled tube, we can find the polar second moment of area of this tube using this equation. So this is an exact equation. Pi over 32, fourth power of outer diameter minus fourth power of inner diameter. And the difference between DI and DI is the twice the thickness. I also showed you that we can divide this to two sections. And based on the thin walled theory, we can say the polar second moment of area is two pi r cubed t. Is he okay? Is he all right? Okay, okay. That's all right, no. <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much for helping him. That's fantastic. You're very good. Well done. See, is he, where did he go? Um, it, it's just a little bit about this Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, okay. So he's all right now. So we can either use the equation. We can either use equation on the right hand side. So the equation on the right-hand side is the exact solution, and the equation on the left-hand side is an approximate solution. If the thickness is a small, then we can say these two give us almost the same answer. For your lower three assignment sheet, you can use either of these two. Both give you almost the same answer. There's no difference. The thickness is about three millimeters. It's two, three millimeters, so you can get a very good answer. Either of those two are correct. It's correct. Now let's go to a slide number nine, please. Now I said uh, that we can apply the equation I showed you for torsion, uh, for shear stress and angle of twist, for a circular cylinder, thin walled cylinder. We can also apply them to a thin walled cylinder. But please write down on top of slide number nine, the thickness is a uniform a common mistake among you. We are going to solve a similar question in the next part, which has non-uniform thickness around it, and we cannot apply this theory anymore. So on slide number nine, we've got a thin walled tube with a uniform thickness, which is subject to torsion. Say the mean diameter of this tube is a DM. So the mean diameter is the Average of the outer diameter and inner diameter. So I've shown you this, um, I've shown this tube now by just a line with the mean diameter of dm and the thickness of t. And that is the torque applied to this thin walled tube. So that's the equation the exact value for finding the polar second moment of area. And this is an approximate solution. Now say I use the approximate solution, g which is equal to two pi r cubed t, or I write it in terms of the diameter. <coughs> and that is the equation I can come up with. If I write the approximate value, for writing j, I can say j is equal to pi dm cubed multiplied by t divided by 4. And because pi dm squared divided by 4 is the area surrounded by the perimeter, I can say j is equal to the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by the diameter of the tube multiplied by t. A common mistake among you in exam. Here A is not the cross-sectional area. A is the area enclosed by the perimeter. This section is hollow. There is no material here. But based on this thin walled theory, we said that J approximately is equal to the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by the diameter of the tube multiplied by the thickness. So this is the third time I'm repeating here this 
um, definition. A is the area enclosed by the perimeter. The cross-sectional area this, is this area. This is the cross-sectional area. Now I'm going to use the equation for finding the shear stress. This is a circular cylinder. This equation is still valid. We only have at the moment <laughs> one diameter, which is a mean diameter. So therefore, R is equal to mean radius. Now I substitute the value of J from the top equation and I write it as T times DM over two divided by ADMT. Now these two are going to be canceled out. So I can say two is equal to two times A, <laughs> area enclosed by the perimeter, multiplied by the product of the thickness and the shear stress. So the torque applied for a thin wall cylinder is equal to 2A times T times 2. The product of T times 2 is called a shear flow. Or the force applied per unit length of the structure. I can say T, the torque applied, is equal to 2A multiplied by Q. The Q is a shear flow. If Q is the product of T and 2, what is the unit of Q? The unit of 2 is, is force per unit area. If I multiply it by a length, is the force per unit length? Absolutely. So Newton per meter or Newton <coughs> per millimeter. Now for thin wall sections, it's more convenient to use a shear flow right, than shear stress. Because the section is very thin, it's better to use a shear flow, which is the force applied per unit length of the section. So if I was asked in exam, what is Q? I would say Q is the product of the shear stress and the thickness. Or is the force applied per unit length of the section. And if I was asked that what's the unit, you can sit here if the smell is awful, you can sit here. Would you like to sit here? Would you, if you are holding your mouth? Oh yeah, yeah. okay. So uh, shear flow is the, f the unit of shear flow is the force applied per unit length. So I showed you that for a thin walled circular cylinder, we can say the torque is equal to two times the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by the shear flow. And the shear flow is the force applied per unit length, which we use it mostly for thin sections. Now, I use a slide number nine as a transition between the, whatever you learn in the first part of this chapter and what you're going to learn in the second part of the chapter. You can analyze this using whatever equations I'm going to show you next week. You can also solve this problem using the equations I covered so far. So this gives you a bit good understanding how both theories work. But if I re in change the thickness of this section, make it non-uniform thickness, then I cannot do that anymore. I can only do that if the thickness is uniform. I can analyze it based on both the theories. Now, any questions in regard to slide number nine? Okay. Now, yeah, I'm going to solve one question for you based on slide number nine. Again, this is very similar to the two we are going to do experiment on. So we've got an aluminium, a thin walled a circular cylinder. Diameter is a 200 millimeters. Thickness is five millimeters. It's subject to a pure torque of 10 kilonewton meters. The material properties are given. The problem is asking us to find the shear flow distribution. 
the shear stress, the angle of twist per unit length, and total energy stored in the cylinder. So we've extracted the data given. Material, properties, the diameter I use as the mean diameter. If you've been given a thin walled cylinder with just one diameter, by default, you should assume it's a mean diameter. The torque applied. So first we're after the shear flow. What was shear flow? Shear flow is the product of the shear stress and thickness. It's the force applied per unit length of the section, and its unit is newton per meter or newton per millimeters. So T is equal to 2AQ. What is A? Is the cross section of the is A is the cross section of the cylinder? What is A? Area enclosed by the perimeter. It's not the cross section. So what is A at the moment is pi dm squared divided by four. So this is the area. So Q is equal to T, the torque applied, twice the area enclosed by the perimeter. So the torque is 10 kilonewton meter, meters, so 10 times 10 to the power of 6. I've converted it to newton millimeters. Area, the diameter is 200, so the radius is 100. So here we get 159.15 newtons per millimeter. But the problem is asking, also asking me to find the shear stress. How do I find the shear stress? Shall I multiply it by the thickness or divide it by the thickness? This is the force applied per unit length. Divided, you're going to join him in a minute. Okay. <laughs> the shear stress is thirty-two megapascals. Now, I showed you for a solid circular cylinders or hollow or tube for the tubes, the shear stress had a linear variation because here it's, the thickness is very, very small. We can ignore the through thickness variation of shear stress. So you can see I've shown the shear stress by just one arrow. I don't show it here as the profile, I mean, for through thickness, I have to draw it the way I did it for a tube. But because the thickness is very small, we ignore that there is any variation of stress through the thickness. So I've shown you the shear stress by just one arrow. And that is equal to 32 megapascals. The angle of twist, I can still use this equation. I can either say j is equal to 2 pi r cubed t, or j is equal to pi over 32, fourth power of outer diameter minus fourth power of inner diameter. You can try, both of them gives you the same answer. So that is in radians. Now, are we allowed to multiply it now because the shear stress, we only have one value for shear stress. Can I now multi multiply it by the volume or not? For a solid circular cylinder or a hollow circular cylinder, I was, not allowed to do, I was not allowed to do that because the shear stress was not uniform throughout the section or throughout the body. Here, we're assuming this is thin. So we only have one shear stress value. You're ignoring there is any variation through the thickness of the cylinder. So it means for this case, I'm allowed to just multiply twice squared 2G by the volume of the cylinder. Or I can still use a T times theta over two. Both of them are 
acceptable both are correct but i did it by purpose here i mean on purpose so i wanted to make sure that you understand the concept that for a thin section you just use one shear stress and you can see that is how the shear flow is that this shear flow is actually acting on the section but i have put it on the side but these arrows must be on this black cross section i've shown it on the side Now say if we don't use the top equations, I use the same equations we did for circular cylinders, solid or hollow. So in that case, I say I use this equation directly. The shear stress is T times R divided by J, so it's an alternative solution. I use this equation for finding J. You can see the two are very, very close. So this is the exact solution, this is the exact solution, and this is approximate solution based on the thin wood theory. And I give you another equation for finding theta for thin sections next week. So this is exact solution, J is coming from here. So you can see We've got 31.81 megapascals. Here we've got 32 megapascals. It's giving us a slightly higher value, a tiny bit higher. And what do I do with 31.81 megapascals if I want the shear flow? Okay. The thickness is 5 millimeters. And shear flow is defined as the product of the thickness and the shear stress. Okay, very good. Very good, well done. So on the other one, I calculated Q first. To find the shear stress, I divided it by five. In the second part, I found shear stress based on the equation we had earlier. And in order to find the shear flow, I multiplied by five. And now I use a different equation for finding the a strain energy store, T times theta over two. So this is valid provided the, the section is thin, uniform thickness, we can use that, or this is general, I can use it for any section. So T times theta over two. And it gives you almost the same answer. I've rounded both of them, it gives me the same answer. Any questions, questions on this slide? Okay. We've got five minutes and Please do your analysis uh, yourself. I help you. I give you the answers later. So if you've got five minutes, why not uh, treating it like a tutorial session? If you have no question on this slide, we move on to questions three and four. Very, very similar to question one and two. We have a hollow steel shaft, three meter long. It transmits a torque of 25 kilonewton meters. The total angle of twist is not to exceed two and a half degrees, and the allowable shearing stress is 90 megapascals. The problem is asking us to determine the inside and outside diameter of the shaft. So the first one is a hollow cylinder, and the other one is the question number four is a solid cylinder. So this one, very similar to question one and two. We have a torque of 25 kilonewton meters, but we don't have the dimensions of the section. <clears throat> 
So in this case, so what shall we do here? I want you to think about it. Two is equal to T R over J, and theta is equal to T L over G J. Any ideas? No. Any ideas? So the shear stress must be less than 90. The torque is given, and J is equal to pi D4 over 32. What is R equal to? What is R equal to? D over 2. So we have... Do we get the answer for D here? So D is 112 millimeters. Is that okay? Shall we move on or do we have to do something else? Okay, we need to test the second requirement. The second requirement is asking us to make sure the angle of twist does not exceed two and a half degrees. So if I substitute in this equation, I get a different value for D. 120 millimeters. Which one, don't say that out, which one shall we go for? How many of you think 112 is a good choice? You think 112? How many of you think 112? You think 112? 112? Okay, what about 120? How many of you think 120? 120, 120, very good. So 120 millimeters satisfy both conditions. The diameter of 120 millimeters satisfies both conditions. If I go for 112, then the angle of twist obviously will be more than two and a half degrees. So the first one is the right, the second one is the right choice. So it's 10 minutes to 12, so thank you very much, and uh, see you next week.
Go on. I'm sorry if it's a little bit stupid, but is it so? What's the difference between this SC, which is t times uh, theta max divided by two, and this one, which is t squared L? Okay, this is applicable when the cylinder has a uniform area along its length. And it's subject to torque, and it's a circular cylinder. Circular cylinder. It, Bo it, it doesn't make any difference. But both are applicable. Right. But in the other chapter, in the other section of this chapter, I show you that this is applicable for thin sections as well. Right, thin sections. But you can use either of these two. Both are valid for this geometry. Both are valid. Right. I'm guessing. The oh, so sorry. Go outside and join you. Excuse me, somebody vomited today. Yeah, I, someone came out and told me so. Yeah, oh gosh. Does, um, does it have so? I think I asked the students to do it and tell them yeah, the reporters. Yeah, so hopefully it's been addressed. Okay. And it's not contagious. Oh, <laughs> I don't need to be ill. <laughs> oh, somebody's sorting it out. Oh, excellent. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thanks very much.